Okay, we're going to get started here. Um, good evening or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Justin. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's Journal Club session. Uh, so I am the chair of the Communications Committee and co-director of the RFS Journal Club series. And on behalf of the Society of Interventional Radiology and Resident Fellow and Student Section, thank you for taking the time out of your night to be here for this informative session on surviving sepsis, uh, presenting the evidence behind early goal-directed therapy for septic shock. Before we begin our session tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all members to contribute to the RFS Journal Club initiative. If you or your service line has any ideas on future Journal Club presentations, please email either my co-director, Amar Rashid, or me, and we will add you to the schedule. I want to re remind everyone that this session will be recorded and available, be available on YouTube afterwards. Anyone is free to ask questions at any time uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, just type your question into the question box uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we will keep track of them uh, throughout the session and answer them at the end. Our plan right now is to have uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes of discussion after each presenter. Um, if there are any extra questions, we can leave them to the end for discussion. Uh, also, please check the RFS website regularly for upcoming events and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for other updates and posting of clinical IR educational material. So without further ado, um, I would like to present our speakers and moderator for tonight. Uh, our speakers will be uh, Andy Guo, who is a medical student from the University of Illinois, Chicago. He will be presenting the Rivers trial. We have Jill Jang from the Harlem Hospital of Columbia University. She will be presenting a meta-analysis of the process arise and promise trials. And finally, we'll have Ben Rausch from Western Michigan University presenting the survive, surviving sepsis guidelines. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Spiridon Fortes, uh, who is a professor at the, uh, in pulmonary medicine and critical care at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics here in Iowa City in Iowa. Uh, Dr. Fortes completed his residency in internal medicine at Yale, uh, completed his fellowship in pulmonary medicine and critical care in University of Minnesota, and his research interests include ICU outcomes, pulmonary infections, and obstructive lung diseases. All right, so we'll go ahead and start with our first presenter, who is Andy. I'll go ahead and switch to his screen here. And Andy, you can go ahead and start whenever you want. All right, sounds good. Can you guys uh, hear me okay on that end? Yep. Okay. Um, well, first off, Justin, thank you uh, for the thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Andy Guo. I'm a second year student at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, and I'm actually at the Rockford campus right now. And I'm going to be presenting early goal directed therapy in the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock. And this was a study published in 2001. It was spearheaded by Dr. Manuel Rivers. Um, so just some pathogenesis on these on sepsis and septic shock. When we have a systemic inflammatory response, it can be self-limited or it can uh, progress to severe sepsis or septic shock. And in these more severe cases, we have circulatory abnormalities such as vascular volume depletion, peripheral vasodilatation, myocardial depression, and increased metabolism uh, that leads to an imbalance in oxygen delivery and demand. So it's important to note that this imbalance of oxygen is a important mediator in the uh, prognosis of patients with sepsis and septic shock. So it's been shown that global tissue hypoxia is a key development preceding multi-organ failure and death, and it's critical to provide treatment to avoid this kind of outcome. Um, so there are a variety of assessments used to address this oxygen delivery and demand, and these include uh, assessments based on physical findings, vital signs, central venous pressure, and urinary output. However, a lot of these earlier hemodynamic assessments failed to detect the persistent global, global tissue hypoxia that eventually leads to the multi-organ failure. So one of the main questions um, that we have is how can we develop a better assessment tool um, to address this oxygen imbalance? So one of the ways we can do that is looking at a more definitive resuscitation strategy that involves goal-oriented manipulation of cardiac preload, afterload, and contractility 
in order to achieve that balance between systemic oxygen delivery and oxygen demand. And we have several endpoints that are usually measured, um, such as normalized values for mixed venous oxygen saturation, arterial lactate concentration, base deficit, and pH. And these are collectively known as uh, resuscitation endpoint values, um, as defined by the study. And these are better measures for the global tissue hypoxia that's seen. So leading up to this uh, paper that was published in 2001, while the incidence of septic shock had steadily increased in the past several decades, the associated mortality rates had unfortunately just remained constant or decreased only slightly. So the goal of this study was to examine whether or not this early goal-directed therapy before admission to the ICU could effectively uh, decrease the incidence of multi-organ dysfunction mortality and also look at the healthcare resources and the management of these patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. And as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, early goal-directed therapy is basically a set of techniques or um, assessments that are used in critical care medicine for the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock. And some of the measures that they went over were the normalized values for mixed venous oxygen, oxygen saturation, the arterial lactate concentration based deficit and pH, among some other uh, outcome measures that I'll talk about a little bit later. So now going into the methods, basically this was a prospective randomized study of 263 adult patients who presented to the emergency department with severe sepsis, septic shock, or sepsis syndrome in three years from March of 97 to March 2000. There were 130 patients assigned to the early goal-directed therapy and 133 assigned to the standard therapy. Uh, the time frames for study were basically every hour from the first, from zero hours to six hours, at the sixth hour, and then from seven to seven, two hours for every 12 hours. And patients were followed every day until, well, were followed until 60 days or until death. Of these 263 adult patients, there were 236 that completed the initial six hour study period. And for the 27 patients who did not complete the initial six hour study period, um, they either had to leave or they either had to um, not continue with the study because of like uh, aggressive surgical treatment or they had to have uh, certain urologic or cardiologic interventions done. Um, and here's just like the demographics of both of the groups. The average age uh, was 64 for the standard therapy and about 67 for the early goal-directed therapy. Um, it was about a half even split between males and females for both groups. And for diagnoses, most of them had uh, pneumonia in both groups. So it was 39.5% here and also um, 38. Sorry, let me move this panel real quick. 38.5% in the early goal-directed therapy. And these diagnoses, ultimately, they add up to over 100 just because, you know, different patients would have multiple conditions. So this is just a graphical view of uh, how this study was broken down. So the criteria for enrolling patients into the study was a blood pressure less than 90 and a lactate greater than 4 millimoles per liter. And these patients obviously had uh, septic shock or sepsis. In the randomization, they were split into a standard therapy group with 133 patients or early directed therapy group with 130 patients. Um, they were monitored, like I said, and then eventually they were admitted to the hospital. And vital signs and lab data were obtained every 12 hours for 72 hours, and they were followed up for 60 days. So now I'll go into a little bit more detail about how each arm of this study was um, designed. So for the standard treatment group, the patients were treated at the clinician's discretion with critical care consult with critical care consultation, and they were admitted for inpatient care as soon as possible. The blood, urine, and other relevant specimens for culture were obtained in the emergency department before administration of antibiotics. And the antimicrobial therapy was directed at the discretion of the treating clinicians. And basically, there were three main goals that they wanted to reach in the standard therapy or standard treatment group. And that was a central venous pressure between 8 and 12, a mean arterial pressure greater than 65, and a urine output greater than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So now looking at the other arm of the study, the early goal-directed therapy, um, there were more set definitive treatment goals and uh, measures that they wanted to reach. So basically a bolus of crystalloid or colloid was given every 30 minutes to achieve that um, central venous pressure of eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. Vasopressors or vasodilators were given to 
maintain a mean anterior pressure of at least 65 and no larger than 90. Uh, red blood cells were transfused to achieve a hematocrit of at least 30%, and dobutamine was administered so that oxygen saturation was 70% or higher. So now just looking at a more graphical represent representation of this, again, we have the central venous pressure, and this was, uh, the goal was to set it between 8 and 12 millimeters of uh, mercury, and that was done by giving a crystal crystalloid bolus or a colloid bolus. The mean arterial pressure was set between, um, ideally, the goal was to make it between 65 and 90. And again, this was achieved with vasopressors or vasodilators. The um, oxygen saturation was ideally kept as greater than 70%, and red blood, red blood cells were transfused to keep the hematocrit greater than 30%. And ultimately, if these goals were achieved, uh, the patients in this early goal-directed therapy were admitted to the hospital. So outcome measures, we have the acute physiology and chronic health evaluation too, the POTCHI score, the multi-organ dysfunction score, and the simplified acute physiology score too. So all three of these measures, the first three bullet points here, are basically measures of uh, multi-organ failure or the degree of organ failure. And included in these measures are a combination of the central venous oxygen saturation, um, the uh, coagulation variables, and different lactate concentrations. All these variables were um, basically combined into these scores to determine the degree of organ failure. And the consumption of healthcare resources were also examined, including the duration of vasopressor therapy, the mechanical ventilation use, and the length of hospital stay. So in addition, there were also those um, vital signs and normalized values for mixed uh, venous oxygen saturation, the lactic concentration-based deficit in pH. Those are the resuscitation endpoints that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, the coagulation variables, like prothalamin time, fibrin with time, uh, D-dimer were measured. In-hospital mortality and relative risk of death were also measured. And the differences between the two groups at baseline were compared using T-tests, Wilcoxon rank sum test, and chi-square test. So the results at baseline was that there was no significant difference between the groups and any of the baseline characteristics, including the adequacy and duration of antibiotic therapy, the vital signs, resuscitation endpoints, organ dysfunction scores, and coagulation-related variables were also similar at baseline. Um, the only significant result was that the patients assigned to standard therapy actually stayed a significantly shorter amount of time in the emergency department than those assigned to goal-directed therapy. And this kind of makes sense in that in the early goal-directed therapy, there was a more uh, stricter, I guess, or more defined set of guidelines that needed to be reached before these patients could be admitted to the hospital. And this table here just shows the certain variables that they measured, a lot of the vital signs here and the baseline laboratory values. And again, there wasn't any significant difference between the groups in any of these uh, baseline characteristics. So at the six-hour study period, um, the goal of 70% or higher for the central venous oxygen saturation was met by 60.2% of the patients in the standard therapy group, as compared to 94.9% of those in the early therapy group. And this was a significant result. The combined hemodynamic goals for central venous pressure, mean arterial pressure, and urine output um, with adjustment for patients with end-stage renal failure, again, these are the resuscitation endpoints, were achieved in 86.1% of the standard therapy group as compared to 99.2% of the early therapy group. So now looking at the uh, vital signs and resuscitation endpoint uh, values a little bit more closely, these are the values that um, this paper wanted to highlight that were particularly important. So the patients assigned to the standard therapy group had a significantly lower mean arterial pressure, um, p-values all less than um, 0 0.001 at each interval of the hours starting after therapy. So again, the six, zero to six, and seven to 72 hours. Uh, the patients assigned to standard therapy had a significantly lower uh, central venous oxygen saturation, again, for each um, time point. The base deficit, they also had a greater base deficit in the center therapy group as compared to those in the early goal-directed therapy group. And um, sorry, actually, <laughs> these two bullet points are repeat of another. But basically, it's these three boxes that the paper wanted to particularly highlight. 
Um, back to the organ dysfunction score. So again, we have the MOD scores, the Apache 2 score, and the SAPS 2 score. All of these are measures of the degree of organ failure. And in these scores, the higher the score means more organ damage or, organ, or more progression to organ failure. So during the period from 77 to 72 hours, each of these scores was significantly higher in the patients assigned to the standard therapy group than those assigned to the early goal-directed therapy group. And this was a statistically significant result. So now looking at the coagulation variables, the hematocrit at um, 7 to 72 hours was greater in the patients assigned to the early goal-directed therapy than those in the standard therapy. The prothrombin time was also significantly greater in the patients assigned to the standard therapy as compared to those in early goal-directed therapy. Uh, the fibrin split products and also the D-dimer were also both higher in the standard therapy group as compared to the, um, the uh, early goal directed group. So basically, um, towards the end of therapy, uh, the patients in the early goal directed group had, um, I guess, less bleeding or higher hematocrit. So importantly, now looking at the mortality data, for in-hospital mortality, uh, the rates were significantly higher for the standard therapy group than in the early therapy group, as was the mortality at 28 days and 60 days. So here we can see 46.5% of the standard therapy group as opposed to only 30.5% of the early directed therapy group. At 28 days, we have that same mirroring, 49.2% in the standard therapy group versus only 33.3% in the early directed therapy group. So the difference in mortality um, of the two groups at 60 days is also, reflect, also reflected the difference in the in-hospital mortality as well as the 28-day mortality, again, you can see the higher numbers in the standard group versus the early therapy group. The risk of, uh, the, the rate of in-hospital death due to sudden cardiovascular collapse was significantly higher, again, in the standard therapy group as opposed to those in the early therapy group. And the rate of death due to multi-organ failure was actually similar between the two groups, as you can see here. Um, so now looking at the Treatments administered, basically the amount of uh, transfusion time or vasopressors and the total fluids. During the initial six hours, the patients assigned to early therapy groups received significantly more fluid, more red cell transfusion, and more enotropic support. So um, this makes sense just because in the it's early goal-directed therapy. So in these early hours uh, in treating sepsis and septic shock, um, these patients were more aggressively treated. However, as we can see in the following hours from 7 to 72 hours, the patients assigned to standard therapy received significantly more fluid. Um, they more often received red cell transfusions, vasopressors, and underwent mechanical metanilation and pulmonary artery catheterization much more often um, than the patients in the uh, early uh, goal-directed therapy group. So now looking at the healthcare resource consumption, there were no significant differences between the two groups in the mean duration of vasopressor therapy, the mean duration of mechanical ventilation, or the mean length of stay in the hospital. However, of the patients who survived the two hospital discharge, those who were assigned to standard therapy had a significantly longer time in the hospital than those assigned to early goal-directed therapy. So points of discussion, there were two main points that the article wanted to make. The first was with sudden cardiovascular collapse. So the incidence, um, as we saw with the mortality data, with um, the incidence of the death due to sudden cardiovascular collapse in the standard therapy group was approximately double that in the early therapy group. Um, again, here are the numbers, 25 out of 119 in the standard therapy group, whereas the early goal-directed therapy group only had 12 out of 117. Um, so if sudden cardiovascular collapse can be prevented, the subsequent need for the vasopressors, mechanical ventilation, and pulmonary artery catheterization diminishes. And this result is ultimately reflective of what we can see in this table. Again, the initial six hours, uh, there's more aggressive treatment seen in the early goal-directed therapy groups. And later on, um, the patients in the standard group had to undergo more mechanical ventilation or more uh, interventions in the form of pulmonary artery catheterization. 
Another point of uh, discussion is also the mortality. So the patients who had early goal-directed therapy had a significantly less in-hospital 28-day and 68-day mortality. Um, so it can be seen that uh, early identification of patients with more insidious illness, uh, which again is the global hypoxia, the imbalance in oxygen demand and supply uh, accompanied by stable vital signs will decrease mortality in patients with sepsis or septic shock. Um, so the main conclusions from this study and paper were that applying goal-directed therapy at an earlier stage of disease and sepsis can lead to significant benefits with respect to outcomes. Um, goal-directed therapy provided at an earlier stage of severe sepsis and septic shock had significantly had significant short-term and long-term benefits, and the benefits ultimately arise from the early identification of patients at high risk for cardiovascular collapse to restore that balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen demand. And in the future, investigators uh, conducting outcome trials in patients with sepsis should consider the quality and timing of resuscitation before enrollment as an important outcome variable. Um, and yeah, with that, that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions uh, from the audience or anything, just let me know. Any questions? So if we have no questions, uh, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, yes, And, go ahead. Andy? Yes. yes, first of all, a very good uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, Maybe uh, Justin, can you put me? Can you uh, can you put my second slide? Is that possible or not? Anyway, I can tell you this. The, usually, the approach that I have, like of doing critique in a, in a, in a, in a study, is this. So the first question I ask is if it's that a relevant study. And mm -hmm. obviously, we are going to talk about, we are going to go, uh, you know, it's a relevant study. There's no question about that. Um, if it is adequate, uh, uh, if we have adequate reporting of the, of, the, of the results of the study, then obviously we have. Uh, the, the largest part is the interpretation of the study. Now, I would ask you what, so, and uh, actually the first one, the, the, the very first one, Yes, this one. Yes, the second one. The second one. So we don't I have. So no, no, the previous one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So this is how you know the manuscript. How I go, you know, to um, um, uh, you know, uh, how I criticize the study. So we are. I mean, it's good to, to have that like um, uh, steps, you know, to go uh, for each step, you know, to see if the study meets that criteria. For example, like if the patient, the validity of the study, the, 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 the study um, actually measure what's supposed to measure and it did. Uh, the interpretation, if we can generalize the results for all the ICU patients, if it's applicable and what we should do next. Anyway, and I will go straight to, to my question right now. Uh, so if you saw this, the study, what you would change in your clinical practice? So what did, did you get that from the study? What did you get from the study? Um, yeah, so I think uh, one of the main conclusions of the study and also one that I had when I was reading through it was that having these earlier goal-directed therapies would play a critical role in, I guess, treating these patients, um, having a more defined way and more set guidelines can actually decrease the amount of interventions later on in the course of the disease. Uh, you know, as we saw in that one table uh, with the, the amount of pulmonary artery catheterization and also the amount of mechanical Very ventilation, good. it was both, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, I think I, I got to click on this. Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> they were both uh, decreased. Sorry, let me go find that paper. Yeah, they were both decreased in the early goal-directed therapy group. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of just generalizability, uh, 
besides looking at the mechanical ventilation and also the catheterization, I guess the paper could have looked more into the amount of pharmacological agents used after 72 hours. I think that would be interesting as well. Um, or I guess, yeah, the amount of antibiotic use perhaps following 72 hours. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that it would be less than less in the early goal-directed group, but uh, that would be an interesting question to look after as well. So um, what about, so I can tell you this, uh, from this study, most of the people, uh, first of all, I agree with what, what we said. Uh, uh, you know, you increase the mechanical ventilation which is associated with more complication, although, although that could be because the patient that they went to the standard therapy, they actually got sicker and then they end up to the ventilator. Uh, PA catheter uh, um, uh, could be uh, is also associated with increased mortality, and uh, in the standard therapy, uh, patients uh, use um, more PA catheter. But let me um, go back to the beginning from the zero to six hours. So most people they do, they do remember reverse trials uh, because of the fluid. So they said, you know, sepsis, you know, you have sepsis, severe septics or septic shock, uh, you know, you have to give uh, uh, more fluids. And uh, uh, what do you think about that? So do, does the study tell us about, uh, uh, it's only about fluids, tell us a lot about, you know, do we have to give fluids early or what you would do if you, I mean, probably now you know, uh, uh, but, uh, uh what what let's say that the study came now would you give more fluids to the, your patients at the first uh, hours um well i mean the study itself uh i don't think it necessarily addressed the the aggressiveness of fluid like administering mm -hmm. fluids but mm -hmm. seeing the results now i think it would make sense to give more aggressive treatment uh more more fluids i guess earlier in the course of treatment yeah Thanks. so that's a very good answer but, but i can tell you this most of the people after the study they uh first of all they they, they adopted a kind of a, um, a protocol for uh treating patients with sepsis mm -hmm. uh, and they started giving more fluids uh yes. which they misinterpreted uh, uh, the study because the study didn't say anything about fluids the study was a protocolized approach to patients with septic shock right uh, and um, uh, but what is left are actually what the impression was like just give fluids, just give fluids, just give fluids. And um, as we're going to see later on, uh, I don't know if that's actually that effective or not. Now, I have a few comments also in the early. Uh, in this trial, and we're going to see that in comparison with the other trials, we're going, or like the meta-analysis of the other trials we're going to see later on, there's only like less than 10% of the patient excluded uh, uh, in, in, in enrollment. So it's very, very high uh, inclusion rate or like very, very low exclusion rate compared to the others. Uh, the other thing is also that, as you saw already, the patients in the well directed therapy, they got a lot of uh, blood transfusions, yeah. which means some, um, some of the amount of the fluid that they got was blood and not uh, 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 crystalloids. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, we don't know, they don't report in the study, but my, uh, but my impression is that patients had not received any fluids before the randomization in the trials. And that we are going to see in the comparison with the other trials that some most of the uh, most of the the majority of the patients they got some fluid uh, before the randomization. So what that means is that uh, now you can see that in the first six hours the early goal directed uh, uh, therapy treatment got five liters versus three point five liters um, of the standard therapy. If you subtract one unit of blood that they got more, and if you know. Uh, you you subtract some of the fluids that they would get anyway at the beginning of uh, at the presentation of the ED. So at the end, there is no probably that much of the different fluids in the ELGO directly in standard therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's pretty much uh, I have to say. So 
um, uh, that the fluid was not only the um, was not the most uh, important, you know, part of the study, but that was the impression of the that what that, that most of the, the 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 readers took it took from that study, and that changed our how we practice, and most of the people start giving fluids more and more uh, right. later. On. Okay, yeah, that that's an interesting comment, just because. Um, yeah, they didn't necessarily address the the total fluids particularly. Um, so yeah, I could see why that would come off as the interpretation of this table, especially because it's so statistically significant between the groups. So yeah. All right, thanks, uh, Andy and Dr. Fortes. So uh, we will move on to our second uh, article then, uh, who's going to be, which is going to be presented by Jill. Jill, you can start whenever you're ready. Great. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Let me minimize this. All right, thanks, Andy, for giving a very comprehensive introduction and uh, physiology about septic shock. So uh, this paper I'm going to talk about actually is recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, the topic is, is also about early go directed therapy for septic shock. It is a patient level meta analysis. And uh, I'm Jill, by the way, I'm a radiology resident. So as we already heard from the discussion about the paper presented by Andy, uh, the reverse trial is a single center trial. And it suggested that the early go directed therapy, EGDT, reduced mortality from septic shock as compared to patients who received uric care. However, after that, first initial reverse trial, there were three multi-center randomized clinical trials published that showed no benefit of the early go directed therapy as compared to the Eurocare. And these three randomized trials include the PROCESS trial from the United States, the ARISE trial from the Australasia, and also the PROMISE trial from the UK. In addition, a meta-analysis combining the average results of the three trials also showed no benefits of early go directed therapy. So one possibility would be there may be some important treatment effects in subgroups of patients, such as patients who have more severe septic shock or patients in particular settings, uh, like whether they received a certain amount of fluid before randomization, maybe certain of some of those subgroup of patients may benefit more from the early go directed therapy. But when we combine them in, in the overall clinical trial, those benefits may have been missed. So the goal of this meta analysis with individual patient data is to combine the data of the three trials. And so it can prospectively look at the overall patient data. And this can help us to improve the statistical power and also to explore the heterogeneity of treatment effects of early go directed therapy in patient subgroups and also care delivery subgroups. So what is patient-level meta-analysis? The traditional method for meta-analysis aggregate study-level data. For meta-analysis of individual patient data, it obtains the raw data at individual level for each study and then combine them to reanalyze the data. So what are the advantages of patient-level meta-analysis? There are several advantages, both clinically and statistically. We are going to talk about uh, a few major ones related to this article. First, it facilitates standardization of analysis across different studies, and a more appropriate or advanced method can be applied to reanalyze the result. Also, we can, uh, we can identify specific subgroups across different studies and to evaluate whether the differential treatment effects among subgroups can contribute to the different result we see from different trials. 
So how was this prospective meta-analysis performed? Before enrollment of the first patient into the first trial, the authors actually harmonized the entry criteria, intervention protocols, outcomes, resource use measurements, and data collection across the three trials. And also they pre-specified all the analysis. So that's why it's a prospective meta-analysis of individual patient level data rather than retrospective. After completion of the trials, the authors pulled the data from the three trials to compare oligo-directed therapy versus euro care, and also they resolved the residual differences of the data across the trials. The primary outcome in this study is 90-day modality. In addition, several secondary outcomes was also evaluated. This include in hospital and a 28-day mortality, duration of survival to a year, duration of stay in the emergency department, intensive care unit, and hospital. In addition, the authors also evaluated recept and the duration of invasive mechanical ventilation, vasopressors, and renal replacement therapy. Other than that, the authors also compared the cost and the cost effectiveness at 90 days between the patients who received early go directed therapy and those who received euro care. Finally, the authors tested treatment by subgroup interactions for 16 patient characteristics and six care delivery characteristics. For those of you who are not familiar with the term interactions, uh, it's more like a statistical term. Basically, they want to see whether treat the treatment works better in specific subgroup as compared to other groups. For example, whether the treatment works better for male as compared to female. For statistical analysis, the authors used intention to treat analysis. And for the sample size calculation, because this study combined all the individual level data of three trials, it can detect a smaller difference of mortality between the two treatment groups. And this study could detect an absolute between group difference in 90-day mortality of 4 to 5%. For the modeling of this study, the authors used a one-stage hierarchy regression modeling with site as a random effect and a trial as a fixed effect. For the cost-effective analysis, the authors compared the outcomes and cost from the health service perspective up to 90 days after randomization. The costs were reported separately for each trial because the healthcare system have different cost structures in different trials. And uh, the incremental costs and quality-adjusted life years of early go directed therapy versus Eurocare were analyzed. For the result, this study include 3,723 patients at 338 hospitals in seven countries. Table 1 basically showed all the patient characteristics that we looked at between the early go directed therapy and the Eurocare groups. Because it's a randomized clinical trial, all those characteristics are very well balanced between the two treatment groups. In addition to demographics, um, the authors also compared the severity of sepsis between the two groups, those scores that Andy already went through thoroughly in his presentation. Finally, they also looked at the care delivery char characteristics between the two groups. And this is, again, pretty well balanced between the uh, two treatment groups. So the authors found that there was no evidence of trial-specific impact, despite the distinct healthcare systems of those three trials. And the mortality at 90 days was similar for early-go-directed therapy and the euro care. The adjusted odds ratio was 0 0.97. The 95 confidence interval include 1, and the p-value was greater than 0 0.5. So this Figure one showed that there was no significant difference in the duration of survival to a year between the two groups who received early go directed therapy 
and those who received euro care. In addition, the authors also found that early goal directed therapy was actually associated with greater mean use of intensive care and also cardiovascular support than the euro care group. For all the subgroup analysis, they showed no benefit from early goal directed therapy for patients with worse septic shock or for hospital with lower propensity to use vasopressors or fluids during urea resuscitation. For the 22 subgroup analysis, there were two significant interactions. However, because this study didn't adjust for multiple comparison from the statistical method point of view, so these two significant interactions could just be uh, due to statistical chance alone, rather than some clinical meaningful um, interactions. So for the cost-infective analysis in each trial, the average cost up to 90 days was higher in the goal, early goal directed therapy as compared to the Eurocare group. And the average quality of life scores and quality adjusted life years were similar between the two treatment groups. So in conclusion, the early goal directed therapy did not result in better outcomes than Eurocare. And in contrast, the early goal directed therapy was actually associated with higher hospitalization costs across a broad range of patients and hospital characteristics. So thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to the questions. Any, any questions? Then, Zilla, I have to ask you questions. Mm -hmm. So I will start uh, uh, with an easy one. So, so uh, you read this study now. So what you would say about the early goal uh, uh, directed uh, uh, treatment in sepsis? Would you have your hospital? I mean, you, do you have your, uh, sorry, the emergency, your emergency department or the ICU have a, a protocol like that? Um, probably not, because uh, um, the three individual multi-center trials showed no benefit of early goal directed therapy and a multi uh, meta-analysis of at the study level and at the patient level also showed no benefit of the therapy so from the uh, evidence-based medicine standpoint i wouldn't recommend this okay so um most of the people and now i i guess probably you have read uh, the the it's paper uh, like a, a separate list. Um, if you see, uh, uh, for example, each paper separately, for example, like uh, I will again insist on the fluid administration. There was no difference between the IV fluid administration. There was a lot of things that in the re in reverse trials, there was a difference between the, the, uh, the early goal directed group versus the standard care there was a lot of difference in what uh, uh, the physicians and the clinician did in these trials there was not that much different for example i am taking as an example the fluid so there was not much clue uh, like difference in fluid administration so what that means is that probably after a reverse trial a lot of uh, physicians a lot of the hospitals have changed the way that they practice and they have changed the way that treat uh, uh, septic shock and have they adopted this kind of uh, early or a part of the early goal uh, um, directed uh, uh, protocol so yeah i think that's a good point uh, they probably changed the euro care so the comparison group actually changed even though the early goal directed therapy group still use the same protocol exactly exactly and if you see one of the trials, uh, the the United this one the, I forgot the process trial. Okay, in the United States, they even used like three different groups. So one group was usual care, one group was protocol, uh, another protocol, and another, and then and also the early goal directed, and um, also they found no no difference. But you know, there's people that have developed other protocols, you know, similar to to reverse. And they they use 
uh, uh, parts of the, of the of the reverse protocols. Um, I think the key part, the the key message from the reverse trial, and I think everybody does that right now. It's like act fast. Everybody, you know, when you have septic septic shock, you need to be alerted and act fast. You know, do something. Improve the hemodynamics with fluids or pressure. Give antibiotics early. Um, um, now let me tell you something else. So I noticed in the reverse trials, you know, the antibiotics which are administered about 80 to 90 percent of the time before six hours in both groups. But they didn't they didn't say about you know uh, uh, how fast. Like was it one hour or two hours, three hours? In this in this meta analysis, I don't know if that in meta analysis or in in the trials of meta analysis they they reported that the the antibiotics were given like in 70 minutes, in about an hour, which is probably much faster than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, now I have like a few other questions and that's a little bit more difficult. It's mostly about the statistics and it's okay that you don't know. I don't know even all the statistics. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with what hierarchical model meals, uh, hierarchical models? They use hierarchical yeah. models. And if you I tell to them, to the, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, go on, yes. Yeah, I think they probably did a mixed in facts model. So in the mixed in facts model, they have a fixed in facts that um, I think they did this one by, by trial. And they also have a random in fact, um, but it's just like a modeling thing. Um, yeah. It's more to help adjust the heterogeneity. Exactly, so another way to put it is like, so the early goal directed treatment uh, maybe was uh, in the same hospital may act sorry in one hospital may act different than another hospital. So you have to take in your analysis you have to take in the co uh, in the consideration the different facilities the different hospitals. So hierarchical model is like is when you take in this particular uh, case when they take the fas the facility as an random effect, which means that maybe my my treatment my early goal directment therapy acts different in different hospitals and they adjust for that so because it could be that worked only in one hospital and we saw an effect um, uh, only from one hospital that drove all the results to, in our meta-analysis to look like the early goal directed treatment was helpful so these hierarchical models are more conservative uh, than you know like a uh, 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 a typical, you know, uh, uh, Cox hazard regression models. Um, I think that's pretty much. I have, you know, uh, uh, for you. give me a second. Let me see. I have made some notes. No, I think that's pretty much. I think we can. Uh, if and nobody else has any, uh, any other questions. Great questions. Can, Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, we can go to the other one. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Jill. Very Thank cool. you. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> so next we have Ben uh, presenting the uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And Ben, you can go ahead and start. Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. As uh, mentioned, I'll be uh, presenting the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, uh, 2017 guidelines specifically. Uh, so there's a lot of guidelines, and I'll try to cover the uh, – the most important ones, but before we get into that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the uh, SEC guidelines. So the initial um, at, or the initial uh, surviving sepsis guidelines were first published in 2004, and they've been updated uh, in 2008, 2012, and then in January of 2017. So um, a lot of what Jill talked about um, kind of guided uh, the 2017 update. Uh, so they reflect the results of the promise uh, or the process promise in the rise trials um, and you know she she did a really great job talking about the prism analysis on those um, so the methods used for the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines uh, were that th there was a consensus committee of 55 international experts that represented uh, 25 international organizations uh, they had you know different meetings and the big standalone meeting was in December of 2015 
uh, they, they put together a panel that consists of five different sections, hemodynamics, infection, adjunctive therapies, metabolic, and uh, ventilation. Um, there's a lot I could talk about with the methods of that, but for the sake of time, um, they, they focus on uh, PICO questions and, and uh, some other things as well. But, but what came of that was uh, they provided 93 statements on early management and resuscitation of patients with sepsis or septic shock. Uh, overall, 32 of those were strong recommendations, 39 were weak recommendations, and 18 were best practice statements. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I'll, I'll cover all of the best practice and strong recommendations and some of the weak recommendations, but after you know, I go through the presentation, if there are any questions about any other parts, we can talk about those as well. So as uh, this, the newest iteration of surviving sepsis guidelines came out, the sepsis three uh, definition of sepsis uh, came out as well. So sepsis is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Uh, end organ damage is identified as an acute change in total um, SOFA uh, assessment score of uh, greater than or equal to two. Um, and that no longer is SIRS criteria uh, a part of the, the definition according to uh, what the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines put out. Uh, septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which circulatory, cellular, and metabolic abnormalities are associated with, uh, you know, as it says, a greater risk of mortality than with sepsis alone. And uh, they actually go as far as to, uh, it's clinically identified by a vasopressor requirement to maintain a MAP of greater than or equal to 65 millimeters mercury and serum lactate uh, greater than two millimoles per liter in the absence of hypovolemia. So. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention here is that the definition of severe sepsis uh, is no longer part of the, the definitions according to sepsis three. So I, I just wanted to show the SOFA assessment score for those that might not know that. Um, you can see here, there's several variables they look at. There's a respiratory variable of PaO2 over FiO2, uh, platelet count, uh, bilirubin. Ben, ben, can I do yeah, that? absolutely. I, uh -huh. I I cannot see the, the slide. I you think can't click, see. I mean, I can see your first your first slide, but I cannot see the. You said that you know. Uh, it looks like we're yeah. stuck in your first slide. Yes, 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 yes. Can you see it now? Yes, I can see. This now is your second uh, slide. Okay. This is your second uh, slide. I think go. All right. Go, sorry yeah. about that. Apparently, going That's into okay. slideshow mode uh, took that away. Um, so yeah, I, I was talking about the guidelines here, talking about the results, um, as you can see here, or the methods uh, and the results that they talked about. And here's the sepsis definition that we just went over. So the what, what I was just talking about was the SOFA score. So mm -hmm. there are several variables for the, uh, the SOFA score. Uh, as I was mentioning, there's a respiratory variable, uh, platelet count, uh, bilirubin, uh, and also a hypotension uh, part of the score uh, according to uh, what is necessary to, to keep someone uh, less you know, hypotensive. Uh, Glasgow, Glasgow Coma score sc is part, scale is a part of the score as well. And then uh, creatinine or uh, urine output. Um, so all of those go into the SOFA score, which is now used, uh, according to the surviving sepsis guidelines, is now used instead of the, uh, the SERS criteria. So uh, going into some of these uh, best practice statements and recommendations, uh, the first thing I thought we should cover is the initial fluid resuscitation. As has been mentioned uh, with the rivers and prism, uh, th the first recommendation is 30 milliliters per ki uh, kilogram of IV crystalloid fluid uh, within the first three hours of sepsis presentation. Uh, and obviously the, there's also recommendation that patients may require greater volumes of fluid um, as guided by reassessment of volume responsiveness. They, they have a consideration for 4% uh, albumin and refractory hypotension as well. And uh, hypotension that persists after initial fluid challenge or blood lactate concentration greater than four millimoles per liter uh, may also require greater volumes. Uh, now, as was sort of mentioned with the early goal-directed therapies that we've already talked about, uh, the surviving sepsis guidelines no longer 
recommend those static fluid status measurements as guiding principles, uh, as you know, as they say, and as we've already said, they, they can carry limited value for measuring fluid responsiveness. So the 2017 guidelines recommend the use of dynamic variables um, over static variables to predict fluid responsiveness, and they kind of keep that wide open in their in their guidelines. Things like passive leg raise, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, discussion on that in the guidelines. Uh, they also recommend a fluid challenge technique that can be applied when uh, fluid administration is uh, continued as long as hemodynamic factors continue to improve. Now, uh, with antibiotics, the first priority is source control and obtaining cultures. And uh, as was uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Fortas, uh, they, they do say, uh, they do give the recommendation to give antibiotics within one hour of identification of septic shock. And regarding cultures, they, they give the, the recommendation that they should be obtained prior to administration of antibiotics when feasible. So those two can seem kind of uh, contradictory, um, but, but obviously getting cultures is, is important. Uh, and regarding source control, they, they state that a specific anatomic diagnosis of infection requiring emergent uh, source control should be identified or excluded as rapidly as possible. And that um, if there is a source that can be found um, that, that an intervention could help, that should be done within the first 12 hours after a diagnosis is made, if that is feasible. And regarding intravascular access devices, they recommend prompt removal um, at, if they are a possible source uh, after other vascular access has been established. Now, regarding an antibiotic regimen, um, they recommend beginning with broad spectrum co coverage when the potential pathogen is not immediately obvious uh, and narrowing once pathogen identification and sensitivities are established. So they give some recommendations regarding vancomycin, specifically saying the goal to achieve a, a, a trough of uh, 15 to 20 milligrams per liter with a loading dose of 25 to 30 milligrams per kilogram in uh, septic shock specifically. Uh, and then regarding beta-lactams, uh, they recommend to achieve a higher time-dependent killing uh, by increasing frequency of dosing. They also give specific recommendations regarding uh, fluoroquinolones. They should be given at their optimal non-toxic dose. Aminoglycoside should be dosed uh, using once daily dosing. And then they are, there's also a recommendation of uh, average duration being seven to 10 days being recommended in most patients. Um, as you know, as it seems intuitive, they recommend daily assessment for de-escalation of antimicrobial therapy in patients uh, with sepsis, sepsis and septic shock. Now, uh, pro, procalcitonin is something that they give a weak recommendation to use that as a guide uh, to de-escalation of antibiotics and because the quality of evidence they found was low. Um, but I thought I would make mention of that. Uh, now, regarding vasopressors, uh, they, you know, the best practice statement they say is that it's obviously useful in patients who remain hypotensive despite adequate fluid resuscitation. And the target uh, mean arterial pressure uh, that they recommend is uh, 65 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the first line vasopressor they, they give is a norepinephrine with a dose of two to 12 micrograms per minute um, with no true maximum dose, according to them. Uh, they also uh, say to consider add-on therapies of vasopressin and epinephrine um, if you're not at target map, uh, MAP, or if you're uh, trying to decrease norepidose. Uh, the uh, use of inotropes uh, in low cardiac output states is also recommended uh, if there's septic uh, cardiomyopathy, which is common in, in a lot of uh, sepsis patients. Now, regarding uh, blood therapies, so the transfusion, according to surviving sepsis guidelines, is indicated in patients only when hemoglobin drops below seven and they do not recommend uh, erythropoietin for treatment of uh, anemia with, uh, with sepsis. And then uh, with, with prophylax VTE prophylaxis, they do recommend that actually, uh, specifically using low molecular weight heparin rather than uh, unfractionated uh, in the absence of contraindications. And even though with sepsis, normally there's a drop in antithrombin, they do not recommend 
uh, that as a treatment for sepsis or septic shock. Some other uh, therapies that they give uh, recommendations on, they, uh, there is a weak recommendation uh, for steroid use uh, for patients with septic shock uh, when fluids or vasopressors are not achieving hemodynamic stability. Again, that, that was a weak recommendation according to them because of the quality of evidence. Regarding glucose, the target that they uh, recommend is less than 180. And uh, they, they recommend uh, that that should be monitored every one to two hours uh, until those values and then insulin infusion rates are stable and four hours, uh, every four hours after that. Um, and they, they also have a recommendation to be careful of point of care, uh, point of care um, glucose testing uh, because uh, it's not always as accurate in these patients. And uh, something they do not recommend is uh, bicarb unless uh, the pH, uh, when the pH is greater than 7.15. So uh, mechanical ventilation is something else they give a lot of recommendations on. Um, their overall thought process is a lung protective ventilation strategy. Uh, some specific uh, recommendations and best practice statements are a target a tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram uh, of ideal body weight. And then a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters of, uh, of H2O. Uh, there's a weak recommendation of higher PEEP over lower PEEP. Again, the quality of evidence on that was a little lower, but I thought I'd at least make mention as that's something that's common in, in uh, uh, critical care, common idea. Um, they mention a recommendation of a conservative fluid strategy for patients uh, with sepsis-induced uh, ARDS who, don't who do not have evidence of tissue hypoperfusion. And uh, positioning uh, is something that they mentioned as well. Uh, prone is recommended over su supine in adult patients with sepsis-induced ARDS uh, that also have a PaO2 over FiO2 ratio of less than 150. Now, uh, mechanically ventilated sepsis patients, they recommend should be maintained uh, with an elevation between 30 degrees and 45 degrees to limit aspiration uh, risk and uh, to prevent the development of uh, VAP or ventilator associated pneumonia. Now, I thought I'd mention some specific things that they do not recommend as well, um, which are some things that I've seen uh, you know, mentioned or, or in, in different scenarios with uh, ventilation. So the following aren't recommended for adults um, or for certain patients with sepsis-induced ARDS. So the high-frequency oscill oscillatory ventilation or the use of beta-2 agonists uh, in patients that do not have bronchospasm that have sepsis-induced ARDS. Uh, and then the routine use of pulmonary artery catheters as well is not recommended according to their um, guidelines. They, they do recommend those spontaneous breathing trials uh, in mechanically ventilated patients with sepsis who are ready for weaning. And then weaning protocols are recommended in, in these patients who can tolerate weaning as well. Uh, the use of sedation, uh, they, they mentioned, should be minimized uh, and in these mechanically ventilated sepsis patients uh, looking for uh, specific titration endpoints. Now, moving on to uh, GI and nutrition uh, guidelines, regarding stress ulcer prophylaxis, uh, they recommend that it should be given to patients in sepsis or septic shock who have risk factors for GI bleeding, but those that do not have those risk factors, it is not recommended for them. Um, and then the following things are also not recommended. Um, the administration of uh, parenteral nutrition alone or in combination with enteral feed, feedings um, is not recommended for those who can be fed enterally, uh, but uh, initiating early enteral nutrition and IV glucose and uh, advancing enteral feeds as tolerated is recommended. So that is kind of a confusing bullet point, but there are a couple ideas there they brought up. Um, and then they also do not recommend the use of omega-3 fatty acids or IV selenium or glutamine um, when it comes to uh, adjunctive uh, uh, therapies. Now, goals of care is something they also have some specific guidelines for. Uh, and that, you know, as, as most of us assume, 
that this should be discussed with patients and families uh, along with uh, prognosis. And it should be incorporated into treatment and end-of-life care planning, uh, utilizing palliative care principles where it's appropriate. Uh, so I thought that was uh, both interesting and appropriate that, that that was a part of their guidelines. Um, a couple changes I just wanted to make sure I brought up, which I mentioned throughout this uh, presentation from 2012 to 2017. So, uh, you know, there's the change in definitions, which I already mentioned uh, for sepsis and septic shock. And, and again, the SERS criteria is no longer considered in defining sepsis and septic shock. And they also mentioned the use of uh, Q sofa um, versus that, that whole sofa ta uh, table that was up above. Um, and a Q sofa score that meets uh, at least two of the following criteria. And, and Q sofa is more simple. It's this respiratory rate of 22 minute, 22 per minute or greater, altered mentation or uh, systolic blood pressure less than uh, 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's a little more simple for people to uh, catch on to. And then uh, in summary, just uh, they recommend starting resuscitation early with source control, intravenous uh, fluids and antibiotics. Frequent assessment of uh, patient's volume status is crucial um, and throughout the resuscitation period. And uh, guiding, uh, they suggest guiding resuscitation to normal lactate in patients with elevated lactate levels as a marker of uh, tissue hyperperfusion, along with everything else that I presented. So I'll uh, take questions now. Thank you, Ben. Do, 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 do you have any questions? Okay, I can ask questions uh, then. Uh, first of all, uh, um, so what do you think, so let's focus only on this, um, uh, on this part of the recommendation that uh, they are part of the early goal directed uh, treatment therapy, okay? So, and okay. I can help you just to say, you know, the IV fluids, the vasopressors, the, the criteria for the mean arterial, the goal of the mean arterial pressure, the hemoglobin, hemoglobin or hematocrit uh, the threshold for transfusions. So, um, how did you think that changed? And I mean, uh, from the reverse trials, and what do you know? How the recommendations are, are different than the reverse trials? I mean, you may not remember all the details from the reverse yeah. trials, and I can help you with that. But yeah, so, I mean, at least from going through surviving sepsis and yeah. and and listening to uh, to uh, Andy go through rivers, it, it seems mm -hmm. like th that focus of those static of, of those specific, uh, you know, central venous pressure, uh, those static measurements, it, it, they make a, a very much a point that, that that should not be used as the, uh, as the goals or, or the, the way that you direct your, your treatment. I, does that answer I, I, your question? No, I, I agree. I mean, I will go, I mean, I will dig it a little bit more, but I agree with you. Right. I like, the, I, re, I really like that uh, static and versus uh, dynamic. And that's actually one of their intention. So I can tell you that the, the river style, uh, then they give like 500 ml of fluids every half an hour, let me see that myself, every half an hour to reach a CVP of A to 12, okay? Central evidence pressure of A to 12. In, the, in the, the recommendation now, there is a like 30, I mean, first of all, they are more vague because they know that there is not probably, that not even the right thing. There are 30 ml per kilogram uh, within the first three hours. And then after that, you know, it depends, you know, on your assessment. And, you know, they said take dynamic assessment, which is the passing leg elevation, pulse variation, stroke variation, okay? So the amount of, so 30 ml per kilogram, uh, it's about like, you know, two, three liters for each patient. So they don't recommend enormous amount of fluids, at least at the beginning, okay? So that's one one thing. Uh, while in a reverse trial, imagine that you have, if you have CVP, if you don't, CVP is not eight, and then you go in three, in, in three hours, you may get six liters of fluids. And that's the reason, you know, they got, I uh, forgot it was 4.5 liters of fluids at the beginning. Uh, so the other point is that they don't have CVP measurement anymore as like, you know, like rigid, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I mean, as you know, as they say, as, uh, as in one of the, um, 
criterion. So the CVP of eight is actually very high. Uh, um, and uh, if you're not on, so some, and they don't specify in the reverse trial how many patients they're on mechanical ventilation if they change the CVP uh, cutoff. But CVP on somebody that is um, not on the mechanical ventilation of eight is very, very high. For example, like my CVP now is, and your CVP is between zero and four, and we are not on septic so. So that's also changed. Um, what about the mean uh, uh, mean arterial pressure? So didn't change the 65 uh, in reverse and 65 here. What about the hemoglobin thresholds? Did that change? Um, I, Andy, you, you might have to remind me, but I, so I believe. The, so reverse drive is like 30, uh, hematopocrit below 30, the transfuse. And and which is probably about uh, hemoglobin of above nine, and in, and I think you said you told us yeah, like less hemoglobin seven. of seven. So that's also you know a difference. And actually, there is a trial about septic shock also recently, recently recent trial in New England Journal of Medicine. They said the same thing. There is no difference in if you transfuse uh, in septic shock, you transfuse between seven and nine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so a lot of things can change so since the river, river, river trial. Um, um, I still don't, be, I personally, but I cannot uh, uh, stand against the recommendation of the, uh, of the uh, survivor and sepsis uh, guidelines, but I still don't believe that all of the recommendations like evidence-based, like 100% evidence-based, for some of them we don't have evidence. Um, um, I don't know. Do you have any any questions? I can put some slides just to show you a few things that uh, to trigger, you know, uh, your interest and maybe you know uh, um, uh, um, you may read some of the papers that I have there. Uh, do you have any questions? And otherwise, I can show my slides. Very few slides. They're not many. Yeah, I, I I don't personally have any questions, I, and I, I tried to go through that in as uh, timely a fashion as possible because, like you said, they did have a lot of weak recommendations. Um, I know, I know, I know, and they're actually a very good presentation. And I I I, I sorry, I I I feel sorry for, uh, for you that you had to go th uh, through seventy pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was okay because it was interesting. Like you said, there's a lot of evidence for some things. There's other things. There's not as much. Um, yeah. You know, so. Oh, uh, one comment, and I, I forgot to, I actually have to say that for the reverse trial. So the reverse trials, um, 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 they used SVO2 uh, uh, from the beginning. SVO2 is like the, uh, uh, either the mixed venous when they got it from pulmonary uh, catheter of the central venous catheter, which is very good, very close together. So the, the venous saturation, the mixed venous saturation or the central venous saturation is an index of um, it's a marker of uh, 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 of uh, cardiac output. So in patients with low cardiac output, like in patients with uh, heart disease or in a cardiogenic shock, or in patients with hypovolemia, like you know diarrhea and things like that, the SVO2 is low. In patients with septic shock the SVO2 is high. So in, usually we say if the SVO2 is above 70%, there's a high cardiac output shock, which is most of the time sepsis, sepsis sometimes could be allergic. And if it's below 60, 55, we say that this is like hypovolemic, low cardiac output shock, and that will be cardiogenic or hypovolemic. So in reverse trials, the, the SVO2 was very low at the beginning. I forget the exact number, it was like below 50, I think. So these patients, most likely, they are hypovolemic when the presentation, and then after the the fluids, yes, I I can see that right now the central venous oxygenation saturation was like 49, 48, and then after fluid administration, the the hypovolemia was corrected, and this VO2 went be above 70. Uh, so that and um, in the other trials, you will see that the, they didn't have SVO2 at the baseline, uh, 
but they have HPO2 after you know the randomization and probably and after they have got got some fluid. So the HPO2 was already high in the other trials. This is just like um, one small comment just to, to uh, about the SPO2. Um, can I have my slides? Justin? Yep, I'm bringing them up here. Or if you guys you have any question, even for me, if you need some clarification from the studies. Yeah, and we'll we'll leave the questioning open. So if anyone has questions, go ahead and ask here. Okay. I think go once. Yeah. Or yes. Yes. So, yeah. I can. Can I? Oh, I like it. I can. Oh, do you do you have a do you have the slides open on your screen? I can change to your screen right now if you want to control the PowerPoint. I don't know if I have. Uh, probably I, I don't. Uh, okay. I don't so know you if I did. But you can uh, can you you can stay with me and we can there are not that many slides. You can you go to the next slide. So this is so this is so this is a um, a study. This is a review actually, the review paper, uh, uh, which I think that's probably the only paper that you need to read. If you didn't read any of the guidelines or anything, I think that's the paper that you have to read. And usually I don't give reviews. Uh, this um, uh, is written by one guy that's like. Uh, that was not involved in the study, Paul Marik, and uh, uh, one of the guys, one of the Australian investigation was uh, from our ICE trial. Uh, um, anyway, so this, uh, in this review that just um, made the figure about uh, the, the mortality, uh, you can see the left, uh, um, uh, in the left figure, you can see the mortality um, uh, goes down as the fluid that the patient got uh, goes going down. So the left left uh, um, y-axis, you have mortality, and the, uh, 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 the right white axis, you have liters of fluids. And you can see as the fluid going down, the mortality is going down as well. Uh, um, now, in the right figure, you can see the same thing with CVP. With CVP, is basically another way to say how much fluid, what's my volume status. And you can see um, that um, the 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 more the fluid that you got, you know, the the, the higher the CVP. So uh, the, the, from analysis, it, this is not the proper way to say, you know, that the fluids are bad for you. But there is indication that the, probably the fluids, the more fluid that you get, is bad for you. You know, it's associated with higher mortality. And uh, there's few papers, and we can go next, next slide. Uh, few papers that you know also indicates that. So this is uh, this is the only uh, uh, randomized uh, clinical trial. It was not done in patients with septic shock. It was done with uh, in 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 kids in Africa uh, with uh, infection, and they have like some. Uh, serious infection based on, you know, they have like change of mental status, you know, they have other um, evidence of organ, uh, like impaired organ perfusion, like a, a skin um, a capillary filter was like a reduced, or they have re reduced urine output or something like that. And they randomized uh, kids based on, uh, uh, on one of these treatments, either no fluids or fluids with crystalloids saline, or albumin fluids, and I don't remember exactly what there was the dosing, but you know they have like a, a I think 20 ml per kilogram, something like that. I don't remember now. But you, as you can see in the figure, you can see the uh, uh, the chance of um, uh, the probability of death was like a, a higher in in um, in kids that they receive some sort of fluid. So f no fluids was better for this kid. And can you go to next slide? Uh, so the, this study, uh, um, it's uh, they use this not a randomized clinical trial. This study they used administrative data from um, from New York. New York has uh, New York State has like a um, 
uh, you know, I don't know, a policy or something like that, that all the hospitals, they have to uh, put data about uh, patients with sepsis. And they, so this data, that, that data set, that uh, database uh, was used by investigator, uh, um, I think in the first author was one uh, guy from Pittsburgh known for this kind of studies. And as you can see, um, the, the, the upper figure shows that the hospital mortality uh, goes um, um, goes up as we delay to give uh, antibiotics. So, and and that's the reason the um, the guidelines, uh, you know, the uh, sepsis guidelines now they recommend like to give as soon as possible in the first hour. Not because of the study, but that's something a lot of people they believe in before that uh, study. And the other thing is also that uh, the lower lower figure shows that. The hospital mortality does not change uh, uh, based on when, uh, how, how fast you're going to give IV fluids. Next slide. I think I have one more slide. Okay, and this is so. This is another. Uh, this is a study. This is like a retrospective analysis of a random of data from a randomized clinical trial, and I think it was the vasopressin trial. It also was published in New England Journal of Medicine. But anyway, this is a retrospective study that shows that if you go to the uh, left figures, you can see in the left upper, you can see that uh, the mortality was uh, uh, or survival was lower in the patient in the fourth quartile of fluid balance. So the patient that got more fluids, they have lower survival. And um, if you go to the uh, right upper figure, you can see that also the survival um, uh, was lower in the patients that have higher CVP, which means again, higher uh, uh, hypervolumic status. So I don't think I have any slides, but um, I just wanted to know that uh, 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 because a lot of flu a lot of uh, 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 clinicians, investigators, after the, the, the river trial, though so the fluid is the, the key part, was not. Uh, the river trial was like um, uh, uh, a, a bundle, and that bundle uh, was, you know, meant to say that we have sepsis, septic shock, we have to act fast, we have to give antibiotics, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do something to improve hemodynamics. And now we have evidence to say that, uh, or you know, indication at least, uh, there's no randomized clinical trial to say that fluids probably that's not that good. And uh, um, and the sepsis guidelines they're uh, more, let's say, conservant uh, in terms of the fluid administration. And all that's all I have to say. I don't know if you have any questions for me or for the uh, for the presenters. That's very great uh, summarize summarize slides um, and also very nice um, studies presented. I have a question. So do you think it could be the patients receive more fluid are also sicker? Like they probably are like a worse septic shock, so they receive more fluid. And then, but but despite I know it's uh, randomized the clinical trials, so mm -hmm. the chance of that bias may be small. Hey, sir, that's that's possible, but you know, reverse style so that the patient that got more IV fluids, you know, they got better. Uh, but the truth is, as I was trying to say, I mean, I didn't go too much details. Like, um, they got like 4.5 liters of fluid versus like 3.5 liters of fluids. Okay, something. Let me see that again in the in the paper. Uh, but uh, the exact number. Uh, they got. Uh, let me see. Yeah, they go um, five, five yeah. liters versus three point three point five liters. Okay, yes, so, but so they got more fluids and they have like a um, better outcomes. But if you see, they got also more transfusions. So it was not only crystalloids. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, so they got more blood. So this five liters is probably four point five liters plus a unit of blood. And now, um, uh, so five. 4.5 liters versus 3.5 liters, not much of a difference of, uh, you know, on f a clinical difference of fluid. So the reverse trial so that there is no 
there is difference in fluid, but I don't think that there is a clinical difference. So there were, um, uh, and the other trials they didn't show basically any uh, negligible clinical difference or not even significant statistical significant difference in fluid. So uh, all the trials in process arise and, and promise the early goal directed treatment versus the their usual care they didn't have any difference in fluids how, how that happens how one trial the reverse trial shows that if you put a my, my patient on early goal directed treatment how will they will receive more fluids and the other trials they didn't uh, i think is as we said is probably the usual the change in usual care but sorry i took your question and i went somewhere else so the reverse trial shows that the sicker patients um, um they show that if you get more fluids you get better so um, we cannot say that uh, the sickest patient got more fluids. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you're implying that from the slide, the first slide that I saw that, you know, the, the higher mortality um, was um, uh, in patients that got more fluids. Yes, that may be a possible explanation for the first um, uh, figure that I saw that. But if you see the other, like, uh, um, um, the other studies, so for example, like this, the New England medicine paper that they gave uh, fluid in kids, and you can see this is like a randomized clinical trial, and the patient, the, the kids that didn't get any fluids, they, um, they did better. Any other questions? Any questions, comments? Anything, right. not even related with the studies uh, uh, directly. No? Yeah. I think also. <laughs> All right, so if we don't have any other questions, um, Dr. Forces, was there anything else you wanted to cover or um, comments you wanted to make? No, I have no. I think I would suggest everybody to read uh, this paper that you forwarded earlier, uh, this review paper, um, uh, the British from British General of Anesthesia by Paul Marek. Uh, um, and Bel Belomo, I forgot who's the other guy from. Uh, but uh, this is a very good paper, and uh, yeah, Belomo or Belomo. Um, so it's very. I think you can uh, see how people are thinking right now, and probably that's. Uh, I think we are going towards what this guy describes. Great. So uh, everyone. Please make sure to access this uh, review paper and read that. Um, and, and with that, we'll uh, end this uh, journal club session. Thank you very much to the presenters, um, Andy, Jill, and Ben, and then to our uh, moderator, Dr. Fortes from the University of Iowa. And also thanks to Dr. Vatican Cherry, um, who's our mentor uh, for the RFS. Um, in the future, again, if you guys have any uh, additional ideas for journal clubs, please email either my co-director Amar or me, and then we'll get you added to the schedule. Uh, this entire recording will be available on YouTube for the public. Um, and it will be available usually within the next uh, one or two days. All right. Um, yeah, so with that, we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you very, thank you um, all for, uh, for attending this session. Thank you uh, very much for everyone who um, presented. All right. Thank you, Justin, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fortas, for uh, moderating. That was really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fortas. I appreciate it. And Thanks, thank you, Justin. Dr. Fortas. And oh, thank you, guys, for uh, uh, for the presentation, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fortas. Thanks.